Some 50 years ago, with the Chinese invasion of Tibet, the Bun Buddhist tradition was driven from its refuge deep within the Himalayas. This is the story of the long and difficult journey that followed. Told through the lens of one Bun teacher born in exile, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, This story reveals something very precious and very old. A rich spiritual heritage hidden for millennia that only now is becoming known to the world. Amid great hardship and exile, the elders transmitted the light of wisdom to the younger ones and the younger generation in turn is revealing the light to the world. Together, they are helping the light to survive and they are returning it back to its source. For the Tibetan people whose very culture is their spiritual traditions, the Chinese invasion meant catastrophe. For the rest of us, it means unprecedented access to precious wisdom. Amid all the Tibetans fleeing for their lives, there was a small group of Bun Lamas and monks. Traveling on foot through some of the world's highest mountain passes, they took with them what religious texts and relics they could carry. Tragically, few Bun elders managed to escape the guns of the Chinese army. Those who did survive found refuge in India and Nepal. In exile, they struggled to adapt to a foreign land and a foreign language. They suffered through sickness and poverty. Even in freedom, many Bunpos, both young and old, lost their lives. Bun is the indigenous spiritual tradition of Tibet. According to Bun history, its unbroken lineage of teaching goes back 18,000 years. So Bun is the oldest spiritual tradition of Tibet. It is, according to its history, or the oral history, it traces back about 18,000 years. And it's very unique in its own way. It has complete separate canon. Uh, we, we call it Kanjur, Tenjur. It's over 300 volumes that is completely different from the canon of Buddha Shakyamuni. And it also has a great influence on Tibetan culture and civilization because many think what is very much in the Tibetan people's blood, like a, a connection to the nature, the spirit of the mountain, practices with the prayer flag, smoke offering, dharmas, many things what Tibetan people do, it is not really from the originated from India, it is originated from Tibet, it is originated from the Bern. So it's still, it's the spirit of the Bern is very alive in every Tibetan people. Present day Bern, one of the five major Tibetan spiritual traditions recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is a vast system of knowledge that offers a direct path to enlightenment. It includes the spiritual precepts of Sutra, Tantra, and the highest teachings of Dzogchen. These extraordinary teachings guide us to overcome suffering through developing love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, and learning to connect with our own true nature. Tomba Sherab Miwoche was the founder of the Bhun religion, and he was born in Tagzik in, in a royal family, in a kingdom, and he was uh, born there but he also have a very similar like a 12 deeds uh, as like Shakyamuni. The ancient teachings of Bon also include poetry, art, dialectics, medicine and astrology as well as deep insight into our relationship with the natural elements. So Bon tradition is, has also gone through a lot of challenges um, throughout his many historical period of time that it all was almost disappeared, then it came to alive back, then almost disappeared, came back alive to back. But every time it stayed unbroken. 
So the teaching and transmissions are very alive and, and warm at the present moment. And one of the reasons, because it was also kind of line was more kept pure and uh, small, it also remained some sense of more authentic to itself. While some burned monasteries in Tibet remained unscathed, thousands of others were destroyed, with only piles of rubble remaining to testify for the long centuries of their existence. Re-establishing the Tibetan monasteries in exile took a monumental effort. The great Bon master Lopan Sanjay Tenzin Rinpoche was born in 1911 into a family lineage held in very high esteem within the Bon tradition. He lived a very simple life, much of it in solitude. His name was not widely known except among serious meditation practitioners, yet he was considered by many to be the greatest Bon scholar of his generation. He was a teacher of many important elders and lamas of his time and was known for his direct, clear, and strict teaching style. He encouraged to create the dialectic school, a place where monks could study intensively toward achieving a Geshe degree, which is the equivalent of a PhD in philosophy and metaphysical studies from a Western university. Lopan Sanjay Tenzin died in 1978. He gave this strong advice. Preserve not only the inner knowledge of Bun, but also everything related to external knowledge and culture. Astrology, medicine, art, poetry, ritual. To serve future generations as a bridge to the wisdom teachings of Bun. That this unique tradition survives today is due largely to the enormous efforts of two great Bun masters, His Holiness Longtok Tenpei Nyima Rinpoche and His Eminence Yongzin Tenzin Namdak Rinpoche. With support from the late Lopan Sanjay Tenzin Rinpoche, His Holiness and Yongzin Rinpoche worked very closely, supporting each other in this great effort. Yongzin Rinpoche himself was shot in the leg by the Chinese during his escape. Believing him dead, the soldiers left him lying in the dirt. One of his close attending monks helped him to a nearby family who took him into hiding. With a small group of others, he eventually escaped to Nepal. His eminence Yongzin Tenzin Namdak Rinpoche is the senior most teacher of the Bon tradition and is considered the world's foremost expert on Bon. In 1964, Yongzin Rinpoche traveled to India Desperate to keep the Bunpo people and their culture alive in exile, he bought a tract of land in Dolanji in northern India with help from the Catholic Relief Service. There, he started a Tibetan monastery and settlement. <laughs> In 1987, Yongzin Rinpoche founded a second monastery in Kathmandu, Nepal. Treat Nurbutse today is one of the most important Bon monasteries outside Tibet, providing a broad spectrum of Bon teachings to 170 resident monks. Yongzin Rinpoche regularly teaches retreats in France. In 2005, he established Shenten Jarje Ling, a center near Samor in the Loire Valley, for the preservation, research, teaching, and practice of Bon. Everybody who, uh, who has been with him he has always this same feeling of being as not only a teacher and a lama, so but also as a very great, I would say, um, like a parents or father, very, very loving, uh, good father. His Holiness, Longtok Tempe Nima Rinpoche, was born in 1927 
in the far eastern province of Amdo, Tibet. He worked tirelessly as a scholar of Bunpo texts. Upon the sudden death of the previous abbot of the Menri Monastery in exile, Yongzin Rinpoche and the monastery elders determined it was time to appoint a new leader. Menri abbots are selected by engaging in many long days of prayers and rituals, during which all the deities and guardians of Bun are beseeched to give guidance in choosing the right candidate. In Norway on March 15, 1968, His Holiness received a telegram from India stating that he had been chosen as the 33rd Menri treason. <laughs> Subsequently, His Holiness worked at the new Menri Monastery in Dolanji, and later a school that awards Geshe degrees with certification recognized by the 14th Dalai Lama. In time, he founded an orphanage for Bun children. Today, he continues to oversee all monastery affairs as the worldwide spiritual leader of Bun. Tinu <laughs> The work by His Holiness has been well respected and acknowledged by other high masters of the major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche was born in India soon after his parents escaped from Tibet in 1959. At age 10, he was ordained as a monk at Menri Monastery near Dolanji, India. There, he was recognized as a reincarnation of the famous master Chungdo Rinpoche, a renowned scholar and healer who died in the mid-20th century. His stepfather, a former lama from Menri Monastery, was very close to Yongzin Rinpoche, who took over the care and teaching of the young monk. 
Conditions at the monastery were poor. Even the littlest monks had to collect their own wood for cooking and carry their own water from a distance. For young Tenzin Rinpoche, studies began before dawn and often continued until bedtime. One day I remember I was crying and crying and crying and going out in the field and said, yes, I cannot continue like this. I wanted to run away. And uh, I packed all my clothes and said, tomorrow morning I'm going to go. Uh, and when the morning comes, I did not have a courage to go. Uh, but it was good that I did not go. Monastic training is strict and rigorous. It takes at least 12 years for a monk to receive his Geshe degree. Yongzin Rinpoche was the head teacher at the monastery. Geshe Yungdrung Namgyo was the dialectic debate teacher. There were only these two. So in time, Tenzin Rinpoche was enlisted to teach logic and poetry on a daily basis. The epistemology was a very strong part of our training. You know, it was very like an intellectual, you know, very regress debate. So you always debate between two people. Uh, very hard. Uh, you have to debate outside in the winter. So the monks, you are not allowed to wear sleeves. So you have to, you have the Zen, the kind of show which you wear on, where you have to put it on your waist. Uh, you put on your waist and uh, so you debate. And uh, if, if out, outside people look at that, you people will think they're fighting like mean to each other, you know, like they're rubbing their heads with the malas and pushing each other back and forth. And uh, like uh, the veins and the lines are coming in their faces, like they're just they're in, in, incredible, you know. Very sharp intellectual training in the mind. And once you finish that in the evening session, you pray as a group prayer. Once you finish, all the monks they just walk together. In 1986, after long years of study, six monks were finally ready to receive their Geshe degrees. They were the first graduates of Menri in exile. Graduation is a time of celebration and completion. But for the elders, the moment was far more profound. It was the culmination of all their struggles in exile. These six young Geshe's, among them Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, would serve as a bridge to future generations. The Bun lineage would continue unbroken. This ancient tradition that had come so close to being extinguished now had a chance to survive. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has always maintained a deep friendship with the Bon elders. From time to time, he has visited Bon monasteries and has been gratified to see for himself the success of the elders' efforts. The graduation in Dolanji has produced six gachets, six seeds ready to germinate. Soon, five of those seeds dispersed to Nepal and Tibet. The sixth one immediately took root in the West. Tugin 
Tomasoltonke, In 1988, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche was invited to Italy by the Dzogchen community of Togyal Namkai Norbu Rinpoche and by Professor Per Kavern of the University of Oslo, Norway. In 1990, the Dzogchen community invited Tenzin Rinpoche to teach in the United States. I just was very young, a fresh energy and I was very clear about what I was trying to say and it was very traditional way. I'm just uh, saying from line by line, point by point, by, by the, uh, according to the text. And um, then I realized people are having a difficult time to understand and I said, if you want to be serious, this is the way to learn. And of course, there were a lot of people who came there. They did not come there to become a Lama or become a Geshe or, or finishing some training. They came there to seek some basic, uh, they wanted to receive some base, simple uh, basic messages of Dharma teaching that they are, they are able to work, they are able to understand and apply in their everyday life. And they were coming for that. Many people were coming for that and I was not getting that point. I heard that Tenzin Wanga was in the country. Probably I heard that through someone in the Dzogchen community in New York because I had a lot of friends in that community and that must have been how I knew it. And so I thought, oh, I'll call him up. And we talked and he agreed to come to Houston. And he came to Houston in August of 1990 and he just stayed for a few days in our house. I was living in San Jose, I was teaching at Stanford before I came to Rice. And Loban came to the Bay Area and, and I went to his teachings. And somehow I'd kind of forgotten that I'd actually met Loban before I met Denzin, even though it was, a, it was a wonderful meeting, but you know how one's mind is. I, I always thought of Denzin introducing me to Loban, and Loban said, well, when I saw you in San Francisco at that time, I said to you, there is a very smart boy, Denzin Wangal. You help him if you can. Because I knew already I was going to Rice, that I would be teaching in Houston, and he said, you help him. And I was just dumbfounded, because I completely forgot that he said that. And then, I, oh, I said to Logan, so you planted that seed? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> he stopped being a, a monk, and, um, and it was probably a very hard decision um, to do that, and, and how to adapt. To, to the society, you know, coming from a monastery where everything was given, um, he, you know, the food is there, the, you know, lodging is there, accommodation, you know, there, there's, you don't need to work, you know, to coming to the West where nothing is given. And he decided that if he was going to understand how people um, thought and worked in the West, he, he couldn't re retain the vows and live as a monk. He had to integrate <laughs> with the culture to more extent. Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche was awarded a Rockefeller Fellowship at Rice University in Houston, Texas. He then received his second fellowship through a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, allowing him to stay and do research with Professor Klein. He was teaching here at Rice University, and um, while he was doing that, there was someone uh, that invited him to Richmond, and, and they started a small center there. And so, John and Cindy Jackson invited him to Charlottesville, and when he came to Charlottesville, it seemed to congeal. And I was actually there at that time. That's the time that I met him. And he came back. I remember we were driving down the university. So he's in the back seat of the car. We're driving down. He says, I'm going to start a center. I'm going to start an institute in Charlottesville. And I was, huh, why in Charlottesville? Why not Houston? Charlottesville. I like it. It's a great place. When I was driving in, uh, in Charlottesville area, in the Blue Ridge Mountain area, and I was just fall in love with the mountain. And I really like, uh, felt a deep connection with the mountain and the place here. So I said, maybe, maybe this, this is the place.
Tenzin Rinpoche had decided before we met him that he wanted to move to Charlottesville. But we, we helped him locate a place and ended up renting a, a duplex house uh, on a place on Cherry Avenue here in Charlottesville. We first set up the, the house that way. And the living room was the shrine room. And the office, the business office for Lake Mitchell was in one bedroom. And that was it. That, that was my bedroom. That was our meditation hall. That was our uh, guest house. That was our socializing place. So it was, uh, it was a very humble beginning uh, in a little house on Cherry Avenue. First, his first idea was that he should have an eight-week summer retreat every year. And we said, well, that's great, but it might be hard for people, you know. So he settled on three weeks, which I think has worked well. This was our first summer retreat, summer 94. We were, Rinpoche was starting this incredible program. Then Loban would come. He came, I think, to all the early summer retreats, and that was wonderful. The gompa is, is in the basement. The garage becomes the kitchen. We all sleep in tents. Uh, we have portable bathrooms. John and Cindy did wonderful showers outside. And then the retreat started being in New Mexico, which was very popular. People come from California, the East Coast. As we were having these events, we were always saving money back, and collecting money whenever we could, in order to, to buy our own retreat center. That had always been Tenzin Rinpoche's goal from very early on, was to have our own home for Lake Mitchell and for Bun in the West. And then there was one amazing auction and tremendous, uh, it was like blessings of generosity were just pouring down on everyone and somebody made a matching grant of a very generous amount and then the group matched it and somebody else made another matching grant and it was just really magical and by the end of the evening we knew that it was going to be possible finally, you know, to buy land, to actually buy something stable. Serenity Ridge is Ligmentia Institute's retreat center, located 30 minutes south of Charlottesville, Virginia. Its nearly 20 acres rest on a hilltop with beautiful views of the nearby Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, and one of the signs that, that it was right, I mean, it, it's in a beautiful setting, but its, its name, even before we bought it, was Serenity Ridge. And we just decided, what a beautiful name. Let's keep that name. Uh, but it was originally a, a home uh, for a family, and uh, the, the area that was we turned into a gompa was actually a barn. That uh, large tractors and other types of equipment were, were stored with him. Um, so after we uh, initially got the property and got the keys to it, our first project was to uh, turn the barn into a beautiful meditation hall. Um, so it was quite an act of, of transformation, but it was, it was it's, it's beautiful as you can see. Here, students receive teachings and transmissions and have the opportunity to study Tibetan history, language and ritual, as well as calligraphy, tonka painting, the creation of sacred shrine objects, and more. The vision of the Mincha Institute, the mission really, is to protect and preserve as well as communicate the Bun teachings and the cultural, the cultural supports of the Bun path. And these teachings are about healing. Okay? They're about finding a way towards understanding oneself in a deeper way. And ultimately, uh, they're a path of transformation, allowing one to ultimately be of benefit to other beings. The Tsalung Trungkor practice is kind of very important practice and uh, it is uh, uh, done ancient time by yogis to prevent and, and heal their sickness and so in the modern time we are trying to bring them, uh, trying to make them very simple and very few of them so that uh, students can apply. So also we wanted to make sure that people don't sit too much but also do physical exercises. One of the uniqueness of the Tibetan yoga, of this Trungkor practice, is that not only you're in a meditative state of mind, or you're trying to be in that meditative state of mind, 
you're utilizing the breath, which helps you not only maintain that state of mind, but also start opening the different energetic chakras, we call them energetic centers in the body and the channels. And as we open that, we're open to experiences that arise, but also that we're very much embodied. We're not just in our mind. We're here thoroughly feeling our body, feeling that breath that goes through our body, and understanding our mind. So each movement helps with the help of the breath to take obstacles away and allow our mind to settle, connect deeper to ourselves, and as we connect deeper to ourselves, connect deeper to others. But Rinpoche started bringing Lopen constantly, his holiness, so his teachers, he would bring his teachers and then bring his peers. So that people come to understand that it's not only a personal relationship that they have with their teacher, it's a relationship to lineage. And that lineage is very, very deep. It's very rich. And there's many wonderful teachers within that lineage. Lopan Sanjay Tenzin died in 1978. Nearly two decades later, a tulku was born in Chihuahua, Mexico. The boy was recognized as the reincarnation of Lopon Sanjay Tenzin. During my visit to Chihuahua and uh, staying with the uh, Jorge Baye family, I had a number of dreams before and during when I was there. And these dreams and the signs that I have was very clear for me that uh, Jorge Rune was the reincarnation of Lopez Sanjitensi. When Catalina is embarrassed, she has dreams. She has dreams. A friend of ours, precisely the one who invited her to come to Chihuahua, she also has dreams about Jorge Rune. And uh, I share my dream with the His Holiness, Lopez Sanjitensi. Lopez Sanjitensi was the reincarnation of Lopez Sanjitensi. And I share my dream with the His Holiness, Lopez Sanjitensi. And I share my dream with the His Holiness, slept night and he also came with his dream and his readings so it was his he was clear for him also he was given the name ponce jigme tenzin by his holiness long talk tempe nyima and enthroned at two major bon monasteries outside tibet menri in india and treat norbutse in nepal and i have first time when i went to um, family and they shared with the Jorge and Kati, they were like a were well, shocked. And they also seems kind of happy, but they were shocked clearly. Y entonces empiezan ahí las preguntas de qué qué va a suceder con el niño, ¿verdad? O sea, en la cultura tibetana estas criaturas desde pequeñas se les entregan al monasterio eh, voluntariamente con mucha alegría a las familias. Y en nuestro, en mi, nuestro caso, pues no, ¿verdad? O sea, yo no me iba a desprender así de, 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 de nuestro hijo. En el principio, fue bastante difícil para nosotros, ¿sabes? Explicar todo lo que eso significa. Y, particularmente, intentar realmente decirles que es tan importante que el entrenamiento, que tienes que enviar el niño a la India y Nepal para obtener un entrenamiento correcto. A nosotros lo único que ellos nos pedían era que les permitiéramos estar cerca para apoyarlo en su educación, era todo. Entonces, así fue, fue eso, fue como así como un alivio, un descansar, un fluir, un perfecto, o sea, encantados. And every time I have a communication with them, they were saying, yes, you know, uh, we wanted to do it, we love to do it, and uh, probably we'll do it very soon, next year, or something like that, and then, then we kind of, kind of more or less agree, and then one year passes away, and then I'm back in the same place, talking with them and saying, okay, now, are you ready? No, uh, something, something, whatever reason, another, th another, whatever reason, no, we are going to do it, we're going to do it next year. Y el año pasado, pues bueno, se tomó la decisión de que estuviera un año continuo en Menri, en Dolangi. ¿Verdad? Y, y fue una decisión, al principio difícil para nosotros, ¿verdad? Eh, yo en lo personal pensé que iba a ser más difícil, más dura, y se fue Catalina con él primero, a instalarlo allá, yo regresé posteriormente, 
Y al verlo que estaba bien realmente, eh, disfrutando eh, sus enseñanzas, sus prácticas allá, pues nos dimos cuenta que, que me di cuenta que la, que la verdad era que era más el miedo que teníamos nosotros que lo que iba a pasar. And his tutor, Geshe uh, uh, Yunusutum, and he said uh, Tuku is very smart and uh, very um, dedicated what he was doing, he's studying there, he really, really enjoyed and so we're very happy it's finally is happening and uh, my prayer and wish is that it will continue his study and training. Va a llegar un momento en que él va a tomar la decisión y, y, y hacer lo que él crea conveniente, ¿verdad? Y nosotros pues tendremos que, que apoyarlo, ¿verdad? Being sometime in the West, I have a, I have a choice to stay as a monk or I have a choice to not stay as a monk and disrobe. And after reflecting some time, it was not an easy decision, but uh, in the end I made the decision to, to uh, give up living as a monk. And, uh, and I felt it was much more easier to integrate with the uh, ordinary people. And uh, then I uh, married to uh, Tsewamo. Western Bombu practitioners, first of all, I feel that they are very fortunate to have a teacher who can understand very well both our culture and their culture, Eastern and Western. And uh, we, are, we have a family here, so we have a, a, a beautiful boy, uh, Singi Wangil. Living like this family life, and just ordinary family life, uh, dealing with every day the family has to deal with, you know, you know, with each other, with the child, with the school, with the household. It's a great blessing and beautiful experience for me. And, uh, and when I, my students tell me about their issues and problems in their life and things, I, I can understand and connect with them much better. So we try to do some fun things together. Whenever he can, he creates a time for us. Whenever I'm uh, home, I'll try to you know, give him a bath, give him a massage, and put him on bed, tell him a bed story. You know, we try to take him to India and Nepal, to the monastery, and to the uh, settlements where there is a Tibetan culture, and so that he gets little influences from the monastery. Then we come back here and take him to the regular American school. Even though one is enough to take him to the daycare, but we most of the time we both go together to, uh, to drop him at the daycare, and you know, it's just a nice experience. But he also, as a child, he is incredible, very special. He, he, he has so much connection to the monastery, uh, to, to the monks. He loves the monks, he loves the chanting, he, he plays with all the monastery in, in, instruments. And so somehow, you know, he does has definitely a strong a connection there already in him. ceremony knowing Singe that he's a very hyper active and we were a little worried that you know he will not able to sit during the enthronement up there but he was like an instant transformation of he almost like became another person trying to sit there trying to bow and trying to looking at people's eye <laughs> Thank you.
one of the ways to bring this ancient Bern teaching to the West will be also trying to integrate these wisdom knowledge into scientific community, into the mainstream Western audience. And uh, it is, has been our ongoing interest to trying to help different scientist groups, different doctors, whoever has interest to do research. So as we've been talking about a lot of research in, in mind-body practices and specifically clinical trials of uh, Salung Chung Kor, uh, Tibetan sound meditation in collaboration, in collaboration with Tenzing Wang and Rinpoche, looking at uh, the sound syllables as a way to help uh, breast cancer patients manage uh, difficulties with their cognitive functioning due to chemotherapy. The question that I posed to to Tenzing was what did he think would actually change in the people who would take up these practices and actually have the become part of their lives? Something beyond they'll sleep better or they would have you know, better arm mobility, for example, a, a breast cancer patient. Uh, something from his tradition. Um, and he said the patients would be more open-hearted. And I thought, hmm, how, how are we going to measure open-heartedness? At the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche and Harvard neurobiology professor R. Clay Reed met to discuss an ancient Bon practice of meditating in total darkness and how sensory deprivation serves to stimulate brain activity. We know a great deal about the machinery of perception. Um, but we also know from introspection of everyday introspection or introspection of a deep and richer sense that our mind is doing something when we're not perceiving. Is this any relation to the heart, to this activity in the brain? <sighs> um, what do you mean by heart? So, there's another word. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, well, there's well, another word. Heart, but if, if it's a metaphor, <laughs> heart. Um, okay. um, The international Bon community is growing throughout the world. There are a number of Bon teachers trained in Nepal and India who, like Tenzin Rinpoche, now have students and centers in North America, Europe, or Asia. Some of these teachers, too, have returned to Tibet. Today, Bun centers affiliated specifically with Lugmincha are located in more than a dozen European countries, as well as in Brazil, Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru, Russia, and the United States. In Crestone, Colorado, land has been developed for personal retreats. The long-term vision, though, is, is startling because what it means is that we're trying to create a retreat environment of a traditional nature like you would have found 10 centuries ago in the Himalayas, but in the 21st century. A place where people can go for a retreat for a few weeks or a few months or a few years to do their practices. The potential is amazing as to what might arise out of this, not only in our generation, but in the future generations that will continue to use this center long after our bodies have perished. Another organization affiliated with Lugmincha is Lishu Institute, a residential center newly founded in India, where Western students can engage in long-term study and practice, and where the Bon Buddhist teachings may be preserved as literature, as transmission, and as knowledge. A stupa, or chertan, is a powerful and sacred structure that symbolizes enlightened mind. It is an architectural representation of the entire path to liberation. Its very foundation is wisdom and compassion. 
The architecture of a stupa is developed in very specific ways so as to support the inner development of the individual who studies it. Every aspect of its outer form and inner content is alive with symbolic meaning. More than a symbol, the stupa is said to embody enlightened mind. The energy of a stupa affects not only the land and space around it, but everyone who comes in proximity of it. At this time, there are three bon stupas in the Western world, two in Mexico and one in Poland. ตาดอปานุจิเจนเนตาสุกบานุนดงจิเจกุสาทุนุปุนุสุจิเกกุปาเรตามิจุเกมดุชะลุซอนานุนุปุนเตมบาจุเตทาสุเจจากกังดะก
He's even uh, introducing uh, through YouTube videos and through his online workshops some a very um, uh, direct, essential teachings which uh, in recent years have been considered secret, in particular the, uh, the teachings of Dawa Jaltsin. I've heard Rinpoche say that he believes that there are many people who, no matter how clearly these uh, Dzogchen teachings in particular are taught, that these people will not understand them uh, because they're simply not ready to receive them. The Fivefold Teachings of Dawa Jansi, it is uh, one of the most important and essential and simple practice that exists. Uh, in this lineage, one of the particular characteristics of this lineage, it's very much experiential based teachings. And it traces back it to Samantha Bhadra, the primordial Buddha. From primordial Buddha, there's a nine a mind-to-mind -mind, uh, transmitted master. So that basically means that each master's awakening experience uh, transmitted to another student. A mind-to-mind. -mind. With no words. Like moon shines in the water. And you see the light in the space, it's, you see the light in the water. And the light in the water, then you see reflecting in the walls and mountains. So that light keep on reflecting from one place to another place, but with no words. In the summer of 2007, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche and his wife, Kondro Tsering Wangmo, led Bonpo students on a spiritual journey to Tibet. From the fruit of the hard work of two generations of Bon masters, the Western students had experienced clear benefits in their meditation practice and their lives. They now wanted to explore further by traveling to Tibet with their teacher as he returned to the source of the light of the Bun teachings. Finishing the Geshe degree, coming to the West, going through all the struggles and beautiful experiences, establishing we sent many centers around the world, I trained many students, and so I thought now maybe it's a good time to take these students back to the places where these teachings were originated. So they can see those places, they can see those people, where these things came from. One time I clearly remember in one monastery when we were welcomed by a community there, and uh, everybody felt so deep welcome by the people. And we were like all feeling our hearts were open and uh, the eyes were full of tears. It was very emotional. And we went to, the, to that village and we were coming down to this clearing. And I thought we were going to do a practice sitting there. And then all of a sudden these villagers appeared with katas. And we were singing Om Mati Muni Do. Very, very emotional. I think everyone was crying there. It had been well over 40 years since the cruel Chinese invasion of Tibet, and the conditions were such that it was very difficult to receive teachings from the monasteries, since it was against the law for a group to come together. As their Haibun Lama, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, and his wife, were deeply moved by the gracious reception and celebration the Tibetans gave them wherever they went. The Tibetans were very touched by uh, Western students when they sang uh, prayers in Tibetan 
And so it was very hopeful for them also at the same time so that there is a chance to these teaching knowledge can be survived. Lishu Cave, situated half an hour from Lhasa, is a sacred place for Bunpos. Many great masters of the past, including Lishu Taring, have meditated in solitude there. And uh, by the time we arrived at the, the middle cave, it was a beautiful experience just going in the cave, uh, doing the prayer there, just this feeling connection to, to the many, many masters who have practiced there. It clearly made me feel that I wanted to go back. Mount Bonri in Kongpo, southeastern Tibet, is one of the most sacred pilgrimage places for Bonpos. This mountain represents the embodiment of the Buddha Tompo Shenrab, founder of the Bon spiritual tradition. There were moments where very, very exhausted, very, very tired, and, uh, and every time when you feel very tired and exhausted, when then suddenly you hear, you're hearing the chanting, singing of Mate, it kind of energizes you, uplifts you immediately, your spirit, and it gives you a lot of energy to climb, climb again. Butuka means the heart of the Samantabhadra. And we all feel like that, with less thoughts, more space. I think the mountain gave me energy. The mountain wanted me to come up. Four hours, 40 minutes, and 55 seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. 14,681 right now. feet right now. <laughs> When I went to Tibet, which was the birthplace of the teachings in the first place, or one of the original places, I felt the history of a lot of war, warfare. I felt um, that there were some people who never received the teachings that we received, and how uh, lucky I was. I felt the necessity to make the most of this life immediately, on the spot. <laughs> on the spot because of the richness of um, my leisure, my luxury. And I felt also the phenomenal power of the environment and the constant expression of the people to express the sacred in um, form. At several monasteries, the group was given a rare opportunity to see relics and other treasured objects. Relics are far more than the objects themselves. They are powerful and sacred. Some bear unusual marks from past masters, such as handprints or footprints in stone, revealing the depth of power developed through meditation. future if we are preserving these ancient wisdom tradition knowledge in the West better and and in Tibet it has disappeared so it's possible that a Western student one day will go back to Tibet and give the transmission and the teaching to Tibetans in Burn tradition there is a prophecy saying the Burn teaching will flourish from the corners of the world probably it means maybe corners of the world then come back to Tibet <laughs> 